absolutely. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break. I'm Lahiro. And I'm Stan. And that's someone buzzing in uh, to join this meeting. So, yeah, we have a special live episode um, in conjunction with Adrenaline Memories. So just uh, just if you're not aware, Adrenaline Memories is something that Stan's doing kind of once a week shoots. Uh, you can sign up. I'll put the Patreon link, and it's just really great tutorials about everything for, for, the, for the primary exam, so physiology, pharmacology, everything that you might need to know. Um, so, yeah, check it out in the link that I'll put in the story notes. Uh, but, yeah, Stan, let's get, let's get started. Let's get into this. Well, no, before that, La, I think you need to tell us where have you been for the last three months? Because I think it's been three <laughs> months since our last episode. Yep. So if you don't want to hear this, please skip forward because I'm, I'm always aware that maybe we ramble on a bit at the start. Um, so I, I've, been, I've been away in Broome for five months and um, yeah, just working on some education stuff with uh, the DRGA, which is like the new diploma for, for GP and East of this. And it's been great because I just get to work on education stuff kind of full time which is a bit, a bit of the dream, but I, but I actually do miss clinical anesthesia. I feel like, I don't know, you know, if you're not, if you're not doing clinical stuff or if you're not doing the stuff and you're teaching it, I, I'd feel pretty disconnected. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to get back to work next month. You've done some amazing stuff. And for those who don't know, uh, Lahiru runs the anesthesia coffee break and the Instagram page, ABCs of anesthesia. If you haven't uh, followed that yet, do follow it because you put up videos which are actually very relevant to, I think, uh, introductory training as well as part two as well, which you do a lot of uh, teaching for. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much anything that's not primary. I'll try to, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so I've, I've managed to get someone to, you know, cut down my videos to make them in bite-sized chunks. So um, I'm just posting those regularly and, ho you know, hopefully they're useful. It's, it's a new space. Like I, 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 I struggle to know what's going to be useful and what's not, but it's a bit of an experiment to see which things are useful and which things aren't. So yeah, like everything, just, just keep on learning. All right. We better get started. Okay. Let's do this. Okay. So the question that we're going to run through today is with regards to the onset of neuromuscular blocking drugs. And from 2004, question two, the first paper. And the question is, outline the factors determining speed of onset of neuromuscular blocking agents. Now, Lahiru, how would you go about structuring or even classifying this answer? Yeah, so I feel like with this, with this question, it's, it's obviously really broad. Like there's just so many factors that could affect speed of onset. So I feel like I've really got to come up with a category and I, I keep mentioning categories all the time whenever I mention an answer because broad questions require broad categories and your ability to not miss things, um, especially in this exam. So uh, the way I thought about this so I don't miss anything is to think of physico-chemical things, pharmacokinetic things, pharmacodynamic things, and then patient things, which are kind of in kind of linked with pharmacodynamic, but let's just put it in a separate category. Um, so I've got those four categories um, and I'll just, I'm just going to literally, you know, if I'm thinking of the short answer question, I'm probably going to write one on each page or one on each half page to give me lots of space to fill those in um, as I go through in that 10 minutes. But I'm also thinking about fixed law of diffusion and why, you know, while you don't just want to, you know, regurgitate fixed law of diffusion, you know, or the rate, the rate or the speed of onset is area on thickness times uh, solubility over the square root of molecular weight times the concentration difference. Like there's not, there's only so, you, you really have to link that back to this structure. But I think I'd, I'd just put that there so I don't forget to write anything under my headings that I've already, already, already created. And I think that's a really good way to think about a very broad answer like outline. So whenever a question says outline, I think it's really good to have really key structures or key subheadings, which you have listed. So physical, chemical, phys pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, patient factors. And I think in someone in somewhere around those areas, uh, probably in the kinetic section, I think probably you can probably put in fixed law of uh, diffusion. I guess it's really interesting because let before we sort of go into detail uh, into each of those subheadings, I think clinically, you know, for us, when we think about onset of neuromuscular blockades in clinical scenarios, um, those are probably the main ones I sort of quickly go through to think about how I can um, quicken the onset of neuromuscular blockades. I mean, scenarios that you can think of where you would want to have um, rapid action of neuromuscular blockade, what would they be? Yeah, I mean, really, I just want for a rapid sequence induction of any sort or any time I actually two reasons, rapid sequence induction where there's an aspiration risk. And then 
if I've got a difficult airway because mm. I just want to get bag masking, everything optimized. So I'd give a fast paralytic agent. But then also in, you know, stand in my favorite procedure, ECT, where you just need a fast onset, <laughs> fast onset relaxant. So um, <laughs> that's, that's an in-joke here. Uh, so yeah, for those reasons, I want fast onset. I've got I to gotta say, Stan, like I, I do feel like a lot of this is academic because as we go through these things, I feel like the choice of relaxant being succimethonium or rocuronium and those properties of it are the biggest difference. Whereas I'll mention differences like, you know, if I give it in the approximal vein, like it, it'll be faster onset than a peripheral vein. And I get that that's a, that is a real thing if you inject from the foot versus from a central line. Mm. But if I'm injecting from the hand or the forearm, that's it. That's, that's really just not the most tangible, you know, it's, it's not the, it's, it's, it's such a small difference compared to the difference between sucks and cisatricurium, you know, yep. if I'm going to use sucks, now, big dose, right? yep, go on. you say that now, right? Oh, but, yeah. I prom- but I promise you after today, after you've gone through your yeah. list and you do your next uh, list, you'll be like, ah, right. I talked about all this and now this makes sense because I can tell you yeah. there is an appreciable difference. Um, as you said, when you inject it through a uh, central line versus injecting it on a foot, like I, I've, I, I've I agree with that. I agree yeah, with that. I've done it on a foot before. <laughs> you're looking, going, you're going, what is wrong? Is it, has it t-shoot on the foot? Because it has to go all the way from the foot back into the, um, back into the heart. And then after that recirculate systemically. So you think about the distance traveled versus injecting it straight into the, um, into the central vein, into the internal juggler, right into the right atrium, right ventricle. Yeah, absolutely. But again, if you have a fast flowing drip and you're pumping it, the difference between the hand and the forearm, it, it's it's nothing, right? But yeah, I, I, I take I take your point. point. No, good point. And and that's I think it's a really good important point that if, when you do give muscle relaxants to quicken the onset, um, you proceed with either a quick flowing drip or you give it a really good flush. But I think we'll talk about the factors now. Mm, absolutely. In that way, um, it'll be a lot more relevant because I do think about some of them. And you're right, there, there is a lot which is probably academic, but I must admit, I do think about a lot of them, especially when I think about onset of neuromuscular blocking mm-hmm. and how to quicken those um, uh, that effect and, you know, things like, like priming. I must admit, we'll have to chat about that, actually, whether mm-hmm. you do priming or not. Okay. Absolutely. So tell us about physical chemical. Yeah, so, I mean, really, this is the... the- I guess, properties of the of, of the molecule itself. So if I'm thinking of fixed law of diffusion, the molecular weight will be the thing that stands out um, between muscle relaxants. Almost invariably, they're not very soluble. You know, they're uniformly not very soluble. So molecular weight, uh, the lower the molecular weight, uh, the, the, the faster the substance would probably diffuse. Again, I don't, I don't really think about this practically. I just give the fast acting agent. Um, but, you know, this is for a complete answer. Um, mm. I, I've also put in here, that depolarizing blockers like sucks have a more rapid onset than non-depolarizing blockers, you know, most of the time. Um, and I'm pretty sure there was, so essentially because of the action that is depolarizing, it will be a faster onset than something that antagonizes receptor. But I'm pretty sure back in final exam study, you know, this is years ago now, there was a study that showed that 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of rock uranium was, you know, statistically significantly but probably not clinically significantly faster like fractions of a second faster than sucks or or something like that so um you know with enough dose you can overcome this physical chemical property or the action Mm. of the drug look i think from um from the sort of the numbers quoted from the books you would say that the onset of action of succinamethonium happens within 30 seconds for the average patient I think that's pretty pretty much agreed. With rocuronium, I think that with the study sort of you mentioned, um, you would say 30 to 60 seconds. But I think that mm. it's not a consistent effect, if that makes sense. I think there are certain um, scenarios where you can create it within 30 seconds. Mm. But more often than not, you know, I think 60 seconds is probably a safe uh, number to sort of use. But you're right. I think there was that uh, study which showed that you can get a very, very similar onset of effect. Now, I think what's interesting with your introduction with physical chemical is that you've introduced the idea of molecular weight uh, into your answer. And molecular weight fits into what you talked about before with fixed law of diffusion. And because you've done that, I'm sort of thinking, um, you know, if I was to structure this answer, I would actually probably have fixed law of diffusion after those um, four things that you've listed, or maybe somewhere in the introduction 
just so that yeah. it frames the answer. It ties in all those ideas uh, together. Yeah, correct. Um, that's that's exactly what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, this, you know, with the creation of um, answers, it's it's all about connection. It's all about connecting ideas together. Uh, we'll talk about this later, but I've been playing a bit of chess <laughs> and, you know, it's all about sort of linking, linking sort of uh, different ideas, different concepts and just bringing it all together towards oh. the end. I still can't beat you, but so I, Stan, you know. Stan, chess is life. We, we know that. That's good. <laughs> um, all right. Now the second bit. Mm. Tell us about how you go about answering the pharmacokinetic. So first of all, heading. pharmacokinetics is always add me. So absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion or elimination. And so the things that are probably most relevant to that for the onset are going to be the A and D parts of that. So absorption and distribution. And, and this is kind of the logical stuff. So if your root administration is intramuscular, like intramuscular sucks, that's going to be slower than IV. And if you've ever had, you know, a kid without a, trip laryngospasm during inhalational induction and you've had to give sucks im you know how painfully slow that is while the sats are falling so you know from first experience or you know that obvious obviously im is going to be slow onto then iv and also other things like you know the vascularity of the site veins obviously vascular but you know if you're injecting it into a very low vascularity muscle group then it's it's not going to be um as fast onset um, you could also think about the site of injection. So, you know, like we were mentioning before, is it in the foot or is it in a central vein? That would definitely make a difference it, with that kind of distance because literally it's a time for those molecules to get up to the heart, be pumped from the heart to the muscles and then exert their action. So you've got that real variable time of, you know, arm to brain circulation or foot to brain circulation time. Um, you can also think about just the rate of injection. Like, you know, are you, are you giving it fast or are you doing that really kind of when you were a junior, you you're so careful about what you're giving that you do things really slowly, which is the opposite of often what we would want in anesthesia. So yeah, location of injection, rate of injection, vascularity of the site of its IM. Um, and then, yeah, volume of distribution. Now, again, this is probably not something I think about a lot, because again, I just choose the drug and I give the dose, but you can imagine these situations where someone's got a reduced volume of distribution, reduced muscle mass, or, you know, reduced plasma proteins, which means that there's going to be free drug. And maybe this would exert mean that there's more free drug to exert an effect, uh, you know, more of a concentration gradient from vasculature into the neuromuscular junction. Um, and you can imagine these situations, elderly patients with low muscle mass, sick patients, liver disease, low albumin states. Um, I mean, neuromuscular junction, sorry, neuromuscular blocking drugs aren't really highly plasma protein bound, but still this is theoretically something that could be there. Mm. I think it's a good point. So with volume of distribution, it really has to do with uh, ultimately the dose that you give to deliver the concentration desired, mm. because we know that uh, the concentration is equals the dose divided by your volume of distribution. And I think that's where um, that sort of concept sort of ties in. But um, I think you're sort of talking about in terms of the delivery of the drug to the effect site, which probably fits into more uh, pharmacodynamics, which I think you'll go through next. Yes. Um, but I think that that's a really sort of good um sort of ideas that you've sort of listed in terms of pharmacokinetics where you talk about the route of administration which is definitely important mm -hmm. and and then after that uh the volume of distribution as well you know i think things like metabolism and elim elimination probably less important don't you think for onset of neuromuscular blocking agents exactly i'm focusing on a and d with this uh that's that's all onset stuff metabolism elimination is really offset stuff so yeah. absolutely okay now We'll move on to the next one, which is pharmacodynamics. Mm. How would you go about answering uh, that one there? Now, if anyone's talked, uh, listened to some of my talks with the uh, in the primary course or the in the final exam course, I always talk about broad questions and specific questions, and how if you do get a broad question, especially in the final exam, you really want to say you know give a rough broad answer, but quickly get to the point of difference. So when I think about all the ons, you know, all the factors that affect the onset, physical chemical, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and patient. The, you know, physical chemical stuff, that's actually common to most drugs. Lower molecular weights, diffu you know, diffuses faster. IV versus IM, you know, volume of distribution things. But the pharmacodynamics with this, this particular set of drugs um, is probably the most important point of difference. Like you're not really getting this effect in your local anesthetics or in your IV induction agents. So let's, let's get into it. So let's, let's talk about two things, potency and priming principle. And these are 
very, yeah, very uh, specific for muscle relaxants. So I feel like these are probably a couple of the more important things to mention that you definitely don't want to miss out. So this is also one of those things where potency, it feels a little, uh, you know, contradictory. The less potent a drug is, the more rapid the onset is because you now need an increased dose. So therefore increased molecules to achieve the same effect. And whoever thought that a less potent drug would have an advantage? Like usually we think of, you know, high potency as a, as a better thing. You need less drug, you, you know, it's, it's more economical, whatever. But with yeah, neuromuscular blocking drugs, in the example being rocuronium, rocuronium has an ED95 of, what is it, 0.3. Um, and vicuronium and the other drugs are often like 0.15 or 0.1 or something like that, or 0.2. And so rocuronium, you need more of the drug uh, to get to at two times, three times ED95 dose. Therefore, there's more molecules. Therefore, according to similar, you know, fixed law of diffusion, more, you know, more molecules, more concentration uh, will have a more rapid onset. So that's, that's really the interesting part about this to me, the fact that lower potency equals faster onset. I mean, that's a really good point because I think um, if we apply that idea to another group of drugs, mm. for example, opioids, there is so much um, there that doesn't actually happen. So you think about uh, mm. morphine, which is a less potent drug than fentanyl. Mm. And in this scenario here, morphine has a much slower action compared to <laughs> fentanyl. So, you know, that concept doesn't actually work there. And, and then you have to actually explore that, all right, why is it that this applies here, but this doesn't apply elsewhere? And, and, and you know, with- Yeah, and you, and, it, and you can probably relate it straight back to fixed law of diffusion and other factors because suddenly with opioids, you have a PKA difference, which is substantial. So the point of difference with opioids is PKA and maybe to a lesser state, lipid solubility as well. But, you know, suddenly you have alfentanyl PK, you know, 6.5 versus morphine PK 8.1 or 8.9 or whatever, whatever it is now. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. It hasn't, hasn't changed since you started it. Uh, eight, eight yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's still around eight. Yeah, yeah. Totally. But I, I, remember, I remember two PKs, remifentanyl and alfentanyl. That's it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I hope I got that right. No, exactly right. And I think that's the key message across is that, yes, potency is one factor, um, but you also have to think about the other things like PKA and also lipid solubility uh, as well. So... Mm -hmm. Those are the things that uh, will actually allow you to actually understand this answer better. Good stuff. Yeah. Now, all right. And so um, <laughs> with the potency, anything more to add to that? I, I feel like in common language, people confuse potency with efficacy a lot. So that's probably something mm. just to, if you know someone's new to the kind of pharmacodynamics space, potency really is how much of a drug can exert an effect whereas efficacy is the maximum effect of a drug. So a, a very potent drug might have, you know, less efficacy than another drug. Um, so really pot potency, except for this very specific circumstance where it really does affect speed of onset, potency really is just a almost, it's just a packaging problem. If you have a really low potency drug and you need to give liters of it, that's a problem for dose delivery, right? It's it's mm. it's a it's a pharmaceutical problem. Um, the other the other example I can think where it's a real problem is car fentanyl, and car fentanyl is just one of the synthetic opioids that's used in you know in the zoo essentially, so for large mammals, and it is it is so high potency that you know any and and lipid soluble as well. If you get a little bit on your skin, it could it could absorb, and you could just be narcotized and apneic. So you know, drugs like that need to be handled with a lot of care, but they're so potent that you're, you know, you're looking at micro, you know, your micrograms causing apnea and narcosis and death. So All right. yeah, we're, we're going to explore the, we're going to have to do another episode of why you know so much about uh, zoo drugs. All right. But, uh... <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't like what <laughs> that, you're implying. <laughs> that, that's an, that's an episode for another day. Yeah, um, right. All right. So now um, how, what else other than potency would you add into the, your pharmacodynamic uh, subheadings? Yeah, priming principles. So this is something that I just don't do pra practically, um, but it, it is, so priming, pr priming principle is where you inject the patient with a sub-paralyzing dose of neuromuscular blocking drug about say five minutes prior to then injecting the paralyzing dose. So if you think about that, you've kind of saturated 
up to 70% of your receptors or, you know, whatever number, but the patient, you know, that you need like a critical mass of receptors to have a patient fully paralyzed. And so then you don't need as much dose acting as quick for the full paralysis to have effect. So imagine if I'm, um, you know, giving rocuronium at a, at, you know, trying to do a rapid sequence induction, maybe I'd give like, you know, to give an ED95 dose, which is, you know, blocking 95% of the receptors in 50% of the population, I would, I would think about a dose less than that as a priming dose, give it some time, observe the patient, monitor them, make sure they don't have any problems. And then when we're ready, I'd give the full dose. Uh, again, it's, it's just not something I've seen anyone do in recent memory. Yeah, I've look, I've done it before, and I've often done it in scenarios where I've used rocuronium, uh, or preferentially chosen to use a non-depolarizing such as rocuronium, mm-hmm. um, and I give such as you know a small dose, so uh, ten milligrams mm-hmm. in a normal average adult patient, and just to see what the effect is and that uh, whether you actually get a quicker onset. Look, from my experience, it's probably not appreciable. I think that uh, what I do instead is that I just use a much larger dose of rocuronium. Mm. And in doing that, you know, I actually go sometimes even above the the recommended dose of 1.2 milligrams per kilo uh, for induction. So yeah. that um, um, it actually gets that onset a lot quicker. And the thing is with regards to the duration, I'm not sort of too fussed about that because obviously I've made the decision in my mind that, you know, this operation will last a couple of hours and there's always that um, ability to use to Gamadex in case that uh, the, you've got residual paralysis. Yeah, that, that absolutely that absolutely makes sense. Um, do, you, do you feel like, uh, maybe you answer this, do you feel like you get a faster onset with even more or is there like a, there's probably a ceiling effect with this? It, this is a really good question. I, I really do believe it has to do more with timing mm. than to do with, you know, whether you start to use a priming dose or not, because I, th- I think what often happens is that when you do a sequential induction with a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, there's obviously that fear that the patient may still be aware on the onset of the neuromuscular blockade. And what I often see sequentially is what people will do is they give the opioid or, or induction agent first. So they give the propofol, fentanyl, or either the fentanyl or the propofol, and then they would wait. Mm-hmm. They would wait until they would have signs that they've lost consciousness. So such as um, not ability to open their eyes, not ability to respond before giving the not depolarizing muscle relaxant or rocuronium or succimethonium. Mm-hmm. Now, by doing that, if you think about that, you're actually waiting 30 seconds before you give the drug, which will then take another 30 to 60 seconds for that to work. So from induction, you've actually taken a minute to a minute and a half to induce. And I think that if you're actually confident in your doses and you have trust in your pharmacokinetics or the onset of propofol and fentanyl, that you would probably probably have a lot of confidence in terms of giving your muscle relaxant straight after um, your induction agent. Is that something that you do or, or do you wait for oh. clinical signs of loss of consciousness before giving the muscle relaxant. Yeah. When I'm giving rocket radio, I always wait for the patient to have some level of decreased conscious state because it's so painful in the vein. So, you know, oh. often the patients will, will, will react if I, you know, it, it's, I, I imagine it's so acidic and that's why um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not com- super confident on that, on that reason. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would, I would almost always wait for them to be, um, yeah. uh, have some level so, of consciousness. Ag- agree. So for those who don't know, when you give rocuronium and the patient is still uh, conscious, it is very, very painful. Um, especially if you give it through a peripheral vein in the hand, I think less so obviously in the cubital fossa or in the central line. Mm-hmm. And look, one of the things that I do is uh, if I do want to induce quickly, I will give a good dose of propofol. So perhaps, you know, I might slightly overcompensate and knowing that, knowing the side effects, I will perhaps, depending on the pharmacodynamics, depending on the patient, depending on how sick they are, um, use a, use some metaraminol, use some vasopressors just to counteract the larger dose of propofol. Um, and by doing that, I'm, I become more confident that it's going to have the onset pretty quick. Right. That, that, and you're giving you and I'm giving patient. my rock probably about five probably about five seconds after I give my propofol. Oh, good. Just, okay, so, yeah. just yeah. So I I actually don't I actually don't feel I need to wait for a um, clinical sign 
before yeah. I give the rock because you know propofol works within 30 30 to 60 seconds mm. rocuronium works within 30 to 60 seconds so I know that rocuronium is always going to work after yeah. propofol now and, and if you give a good dose then I think you should be safe they'll still get the pain before the profile is acted and because there's no and retrograde memory loss do your patients complain of the pain in the uh, in the vein afterwards so, no. Good question. So I think for those patients that I do want to do sequential uh, rapid induction in that manner, I always want to make sure that I use either one in the cubital fossa mm -hmm. or they've got a central line in. You're absolutely yeah. right. In the, if they have a, um, if let's say they're a difficult access and they've got one in the, um, one at the back of the hand, mm -hmm. what I'll often do is that I'll actually put in some local anesthetic in before. Yep. So yep. that um, it will actually prevent that pain sensation. I, I think that um, that's something you learn along the way where, you know, you've given rock and patients go, oh, that's really painful. And you go, all right, next time, that's something yeah. to be aware of. Um, give some local anesthetic if you want to do that um, in a peripheral vein. Yeah, sounds good. All right, next one. Now, I think uh, we're going to move on to patient factors. So what have you got there for patient factors? Yeah, so probably maybe four things I, I feel like are most important. So site of action so, you know, what is the muscle or the site of action? Um, maybe nicotinic acetylcholine receptor differences, upregulation or downregulation, access to the central compartment, and then interaction with other drugs. So if I think of site of action, you know, really what you, if, you know, for intubation, essentially you want paralysis of the respiratory system. Um, and so, you know, and 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 same for and then same for recovery. You really want you know recovery of function of everything. So let let's say small rapidly contracting muscles like you know the extra ocular muscles they're affected very quickly and they've got generally speaking a, a decent blood flow. Um, fast contracting fibers have a higher density of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors um, more than more so than slow contracting fibers, but they do reach equal you know equilibration with plasma levels. Um, of the neuromuscular junction um, blockers faster. So they might have more rapid onset with these fast contracting fibers, but maybe have a less intense block. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably the first thing to, to kind of think about. In terms of like the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor differences, so you might get upregulation of the postsynaptic receptors with upper motor neuron lesions. So that might have a slower speed of onset with a non-depolarizing blocker. So imagine someone's had you know, a stroke or a spinal cord lesion, suddenly you get, you know, lots and lots of receptions. And what you'll see kind of clinically with this is you give a dose of, you know, first of all, succimethonium has a, you know, massive effect. And suddenly you get the risk of hyperkalemic arrest because you've got so many of these extra junctional receptors depolarizing, causing potassium release. But then in these patients, if you were to give neuromuscular blocking drugs, they they just, there's so many receptors to block that you have a slow speed of onset. And look, I'd say in clinical practice, I used to work at a Burns hospital. You get these patients who they chew through rocuronium. Like it's like, I'm, I'm not kidding when I said it, some of these severe Burns patients, we would do, you know, par paralyzed uh, and it's the you know general anesthetics with paralysis for they would need about 30 to 50 milligrams of rock uranium every 15 to 30 minutes and that's just an indication like that's absolutely outside the scope of normal um that's how many extra junctional receptors they'd have uh, and you can you, you know you can just imagine how much rock uranium we went through in a long kind of two to three hour case um you can get the down regulation of the receptors. So think of myasthenia gravis, you just get this destruction, autoimmune destruction of these acetylcholine receptors. And generally speaking, you need a higher dose of succimethonium, but you need probably less. So you need you know, even 10% of your dose of um, non depolarizing relaxants will exert its effect. So you can imagine a fast onset with that. Um, so then the third one, access to the central compartment. So quicker onset, um, can happen with greater blood flow to a muscle. So if you think of the diaphragm, it's it's a pretty high blood flow muscle. You'll get faster onset with a diaphragm than something like the adductor pollicis muscle, which is you know, a bit more peripheral. Um, and that said, you know, someone who's got very vascular tissues, maybe they've got a high cardiac output state for whatever reason, then you you know you can again logically think that you're going to have faster onset of these muscle relaxants with that. Um, interaction with other drugs is the last part here. And there's just so many drugs that exert an effect through, often it's through some kind of calcium channel 
uh, inhibition or whatever it is. So volatile agents, they enhance block um, antibiotics, magnesium, and also hypocalcemia states. And so it's all really calcium related. And, and you know, you, we, we notice this a lot, like often with volatile patients on volatile anesthetic, they just need a lot less vol. They need a lot less anesthetic to keep still than someone say on propofol, where you often need to give, you know, more opioids or a paralytic. Um, I haven't really seen the significance of antibiotics, like, you know, giving gentamicin, I really haven't seen this kind of effect have like, any clinical significance. Um, magnesium, again, theoretically blocks the calcium channels uh, and hypercalcemia, you know, obviously there's less calcium floating around. Um, but the one that I've noticed clinically significantly is volatile. Volatile, thank you. Yep. Um, there's actually a lot to unpack there. Mm. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, which was a really interesting idea that uh, you brought up, was the the difference in muscle groups. So in terms of diaphragm, laryngeal muscles, and adductor pollicis, mm. because I think there's a lot of confusion out there with the idea of onset versus the sensitivity to mm. the drug or the efficacy, if you want to call it, um, or the resistance actually to neuromuscular blockade with those groups of muscles. So I think you really sort of uh, described it really nicely in terms of that the muscles which have a lot of rich blood flow, so diaphragm, laryngeal muscles, they'll actually have a faster onset. Mm -hmm. But in terms of their resistance to mm -hmm. neuromuscular blockade, they actually have a higher resistance. So and, and the diaphragm has a high resistance, but the, because that's really rich in you know, nicotine right. receptors, but the larynx doesn't have as high resistance, does it? No. So this is where the confusion is. Yeah. So the larynx actually has a high resistance. It's the pharyngeal muscles, which ah. are more sensitive. Yeah. Yes. This is, um, <clears throat> this is one of those tricky ones. Um, so they, they talk about the idea that when they were measuring the, and there's a graph that shows this, when they were measuring the, um, the depth of neuromuscular blockade with a dose of muscle relaxant, and I think that was done with vecuronium, what it showed was that the onset occurred quicker in diaphragm and the larynx. Mm -hmm. It occurred much later in adductor pollicis, but in terms of the amount of um, the, or the depth of neuromuscular blockade, you could actually get a deeper depth of neuromuscular blockade at the adductor pollicis mm -hmm. versus the diaphragm and the larynx, which meant yeah. that they also recovered quicker as well. Now, the thing that um, trainees need to know, and in fact, clinicians need to know, is that when you think about reversal of neuromuscular blockades, the pharyngeal muscles are the most sensitive. Mm. And so what happens is that if you just have a TOF ratio of 0.7, it's been shown that your pharyngeal muscles are still weak. Because remember that your, your TOF ratio is done at your adductor pollicis. Mm. And what they showed was that because your pharyngeal muscles still have a degree of relaxation there, patients are still prone to aspiration, which is where that new sort of uh, idea sort of came up probably about a decade ago, where we talked about making sure that patients were reversed to a TOF ratio more than 0.9. Mm -hmm. Because I think in, yeah, about 15 years ago, when I went through 0.7 used to be where it was generally accepted. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that study, um, which described the risk of aspiration due to the sensitive nature of pharyngeal muscles, we now go for 0.9. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And and I really love how you, you mentioned those graphs because I, I think it was those graphs that mentioned that, uh, you know, we're measuring onset at the adductor pollicis. And so if we wait for the adductor pollicis to have its, its block, um, let's say with a short acting drug, then, you know, potentially the diaphragm has already recovered by the time <laughs> it's, uh, by the time that's it's right. <clears throat> but the, I mean, you, you give a big dose of rock that, that really doesn't matter if your adductor pollicis is blocked your diaphragm and your laryngeal muscles are definitely blocked so it is a it is safe but they i think they do say because it's you know adductor pollicis doesn't have the fast blood flow or the high blood flow it's not a central muscle to measure the extraocular muscles for their twitch is probably a better indicator of um you know the readiness for intubation that's right correct and and you're right if you give a big dose probably doesn't matter i think uh the study that uh, this was done uh, I'm just getting up now with, with a 0 0.07 milligram per kilo dose of vecuronium. And in fact, I'm, I might show it to the audience here. So you can find it in uh, Miller's if um, you want to see where this study is from. Oh, it's from it. anesthesiology in 1991. And you can see here that uh, the larynx, the onset occur occurs quicker, but you can see that, that the depth of neuromuscular blockade 
doesn't reach the same level as it does at the adductor pollicis. You see different variations of this graph so that, um, you know, instead of the larynx, you might see the diaphragm here as well. I've seen that different variation there. Anyway, really, really nice. interesting. Um, now, there's only one other thing I want to talk about, which was myasthenia gravis. Mm. So that um, I think that it's generally accept accepted that with non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, they're going to have a faster onset. With depolarizing, though, if you decide, which you shouldn't, but if you do decide to use uh, succinamethonium in myasthenia gravis patients, they're actually a lot more resistant yes. to, to that. And, and, and why is that, La? Yeah, so they because you've got less receptors to act on to depolarize, because now we're talking about an agonist rather than an antagonist. Uh, I think the theory is that you just need more of it to yeah. exert an effect on depolarizing all of that muscle. So yeah, you've got to right. use higher doses of uh, succinamethonium. Much higher doses. Yeah, um, I think they say two, two to two point three milligrams per kilo, like big, yeah, big doses, doses. double the doses. And, and, and the funny thing is, because you've got such weak muscles in this, that you know often you can just intubate on propofol and alfentanil or fentanyl so you know a lot of it probably is a bit academic that we're not necessarily using muscle relaxants for these cases of severe myasthenia gravis um where it would have a have a big effect yeah, yeah i think so um well done i think you've really covered everything that has to do with the <laughs> um, onset of neuromuscular blockade or the speed of onset and you know i think those ideas there there's a lot there and there's a depth that you can also reach. But because there's so many ideas, you know, it's really important to make sure that uh, you cover the breadth, I think, uh, of mm. the concepts related to the onset of neuromuscular blocking agents. And this is a nice question because, yeah, a lot of it flows on well. It's logical. You know, you know everyone knows pharma, you know, pharma, physicochemical, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and patient fact. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows fixed law. And then if you just plug in the gaps, the, the actual new knowledge, I feel, is potency, but that's interesting. Primary principle, that's interesting. And then maybe knowing about the different, you know, the patient stuff's probably a bit unique, you know, upregulation, downregulation, that's different. Um, you know, fast contracting versus slow contracting muscles, that's different. And, you know, interaction with other drugs. These are probably the points of difference, I'd say, with this question and everything else kind of flows logically from your existing knowledge. Yep. Oh, good. And then what I thought we could do is, I've been watching a lot of, uh, you know, Instagram, YouTube, and on the YouTube, they've got like <clears throat> TikTok videos. I'm not saying I'm on TikTok, but uh, <laughs> I'm learning. And they do a lot of reaction videos. So I thought what we could do now is we could do oh, yeah. a little reaction to an answer. And I thought the answer that we could react to would be, you know, Stuart Watson's amazing resource, Academy Nightmare. So for those who don't know, um, <clears throat> Stuart Watson set the exam a couple of years ago. He's created this amazing website called academynightmares.com. Do check it out where he's actually creating model answers for a lot of the ants, a lot of the questions uh, there. Yep. So watch so my face and go, oh, I missed that. Oh, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> go on. So look, I think that uh, for those listening, we will just talk about this, but you can certainly get the answer online. And I think what we'll do, is we'll go through it. And I'll ask you, La, what your thoughts are mm -hmm. with um, which each sort of section. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Here's the answer here. Outline factors determining speed of onset of neuromuscular blocking agents. He's got a list here where he wants to talk about the intro, kinetics, where the dose is related to the plasma concentration, the biophasics, where the plasma concentration is going to be related to the effect site based on fixed law, yep. and then the dynamics, where the so effect site concentration produces the effect. And so that's these not will be factors affecting sensitivity. What are your thoughts? Thoughts yeah, about so that. I guess that's not too dissimilar because um, essentially my pharmaco um, physicochemical properties is probably in the biophasics for Stuart. Um, and, and then he's chucking fixed law into that biophase, which is essentially plasma to through membrane to effect site. So yeah, I, I'd say the outline's probably going to be similar. Yep. Yep. And, you know, I, I think I understand, um, you know, those ideas where we talk about the dose becoming the plasma concentration that's due to kinetics. And again, the plasma concentration to the effect site, which is based on fixed law, and that's to do with the biophase. And then the effect site uh, producing the effect. And that is related to dynamics. I quite like that. I yeah. do like that. That's a, that's quite elegant because it, it it flows logically. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'll be very happy to adopt that. Great. Um, now he's got an introduction. 
And so he's got this idea of onset definition where it's the time to 95% depression in single twitch height. And then the determinants are time for transport from site of injection to muscle, time for transfer from plasma to effect site and effect site concentration associated with onset. What do you think about int that introduction there? Yeah, I mean, it's it really... So it, I'm assuming he doesn't start with the list. He starts well, with that's that the intro. Thing. Correct. I, so this is the challenge, I think. I think this introduction is similar to what he's trying to list out from the start. And I'll, this is probably a reproduction of, you know, some key ideas. You know, with that determinants, he's really listing the things that he's, he's put up um, at the start. Because I think yes. one of the challenges is you have to try to reproduce this in 10 minutes. And, yeah. and so I think this would be probably a repetition of concepts. Um, uh, and, and you could easily just put in kinetics under that. Yeah, there's kinetics, biophysics, dynamics. You could just put in determinants and put yes. bundle it all together. And that'd be easy enough. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So I, I would, for the determinants, I would put what he's listed on the intro, uh, sorry, on his list here, um, under where he's put uh, that description for determinants. I think, you know, as much as you can for the written exam, try to be really brief. So try to avoid, you know, sentences um, like this, but try to keep things short instead, mm -hmm. like what you have up here. The, so, so what I mean that for the radio audience, um, what I mean by that is that instead of saying time for transport from site of injection to muscle, what I think you should write is kinetics, dose to plasma concentration. And then he's got a very similar idea to what you, you have written last. So kinetics, so, you know, geniuses think alike. With kinetics, you've got factors that increase rate of plasma concentration at the muscle, and he's got administration and he's got distribution. So administration, he talks about the root, the site, um, the dose, priming dose, rate of injection, and distribution. He's got cardiac output, uh, blood flow rate, and blood volume. What do you think about that? He's included some of the factors that you put in pharmacodynamics in pharmacokinetics. Yeah, which is... What do you think about that? I mean, distribution, so probably hasn't mentioned... Uh, I, I think I'm happy with my pharmacodynamics kind of aspect for talking about, um, you know, certain situations of you know, mm. the receptors and everything, but um, I, I mean, it probably doesn't talk about the volume distribution stuff there. Well, he's got that. He's got this here. I think. I think this is where he hasn't probably um, described it as. Yep. Um, oh, sort of outlined it as um, uh, sort of as precise as you have. But, but I think it's a similar idea here where it goes increased blood volume, I think, dilution, I think the increases the rate of rise of the plasma concentration. The advantage of using the existing structures, right? So if you know every time you say kinetics, you're going to do, you know, a, 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 a absorption, distribution, and you mm -hmm. invoke things like protein binding and volume, it's like, it's no extra memory. Plus mm -hmm. blood volume comes into volume distribution, but so does protein binding, so does fat. So I think I think that you you can get more out of this by using volume of distribution as a as the title with subheadings of blood volume and protein and stuff. So I I, I think maybe you you'd can, have volume of distribution here just to make no, sure no, no, that no, it's I, a I'd, lot more precise. Yeah, I'd, I'd say distribution, and then in that is volume of distribution, mm, and in, in yeah. under volume of distribution is very many things, including vol blood volume. So I think you get more points. You can put more factors down if you were to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the next one he talks about is the biophase. So factors increasing rate of transfer into the neuromuscular junction, uh, which increases speed. He's uh, evoked fixed law here. And then he talks about uh, increasing concentration. In fact, what he does right now is just talk about uh, breaking down fixed law of diffusion. So mm. increasing the concentration gradient and increasing the diffusion uh, coefficient. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a lot of detail here. And what are your thoughts about trying to include this yeah, idea look, into I, your I've, answer? I've got to say, I just love, I mean, I love the fact that he's got numbers. Even in the previous section, he, he talks about this is the priming dose for atricurium, 0 0.05 milligrams per kilogram, wait three minutes, and then give a two times ED 95 dose and only wait for one and a half minutes. Uh, you know, the fact that he's got numbers there is pretty impressive. And I, you know, I'd love to think that I would be able to memorize that. Um, because it's practical and you know, you can think about it as you're doing inductions. I don't think it's so esoteric that you can't remember this stuff because you could theoretically be thinking about it and practicing in day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, I, I suspect you don't need the actual numbers, but I think it's impressive and I think it's easy enough to learn if you can, if you can remember it for the exam. Yep. Good. Um, 
And then he's got dynamics at the end. So physiology, pathology, drugs, and toxins. Now, if you look at this page, you would say this is, you know, this would be a 10 minute answer that you could write in one page, but he's actually got more. He's so, got more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there you go. So not only <laughs> have you got dynamics that factors that increase ED95, you've also got factors that decrease your ED95. I quite like how he's talked about how he's talked about it in terms of ED95. Mm. Um, now, he, he seems to have a, a format where he talks about the physiology, pathology, drugs, and toxins. And again, um, for the factors that decrease ED95, it's physiology, pathology, but then he's divided into presynaptic drugs, postsynaptic drugs, postjunctional drugs, and toxins. There's a lot here. That's a lot here. I, I, I didn't even really think about you know, tetanus toxin, for example, in the context of this. This is that's that's probably you know, really outside of what I even learned for my my exam. So, and even malignant herpia post-junction activation, I've, I've not even heard of that really. So, you know, it hasn't come up clinically. It hasn't. So, I mean, I, when you got this much information now, now I'm thinking, and again, this is my bias. I didn't learn that. Therefore I'm thinking, oh, you know, is it, it was that necessary, but I do really like the, um, the fact that he's categorized this in you know, increase ED95 and decrease ED95. Mm. I, I I do like that categorization. That's quite nice. Yeah. It's a lot look, of information. Look, there's no doubt this is a complete answer. Um, but, you know, if I was thinking about how I would replicate this for the exam, uh, I would probably have to um, edit out a lot of the mechanisms that he's written down. So because, um, you know, you just want to outline it, like what I would do is I would just say tetanus toxin without any sort of further uh, expansion of that answer. And things like, you know, when we talk about the presynaptic drug, anything that sort of decreases acetylcholine release, I would have volatile anesthetic um, and probably, yeah, probably have local anesthetic, but would I have these mechanism actions? Probably not, not so much. Maybe just list, list the drugs rather than describe the actual mechanism of actions because remember that you know you have to try to get this all down in 10 minutes and this is phenomenal like the level of detail that he's uh written in this answer mm. i think that uh this is truly a complete answer which actually goes into a lot of depth as well mm. uh, so you know for those who are listening do check this answer out on kenemynightmares.com for everyone that, that wants a bit more explanation, yeah, essentially, you know, severe contraction of muscle, especially in people with large muscle mass, they just get muscle aches for the next 24 to 48 hours, which is really unpleasant. Um, often we're lucky that we don't get that feedback, but the sur our surgical colleagues hear a bit more than we do. And yeah, if you, you know, if you give muscle, uh, non, non depolarizing beforehand, you'll get less strong muscle contractions, but a very fast onset block anyway. So it's just, just one of those things that you can do. Thanks. Do you do that often, La? Before we go? No, no, I don't. I don't actually. Um, again, it's making it's making something a little bit more complicated. I, I'd say than it needs to be. But no, I'm I'm not I'm definitely not saying it's the the wrong thing to do. I just haven't done it, and maybe maybe it's my own fault for not getting enough feedback about how bad these muscle aches are. Yeah, but, but you know, we, but the we, thing we, is, do you put proper fall? Do you put lignocaine can in your proper fall? Yeah, I do, and, and you know, I I didn't think when I first started doing, it, I didn't think you'd make a difference like it was just too quick but it definitely does make a difference and I studies well, have shown that as well i'm sure you'll be i'm sure you'll be happy to know using lignocaine yeah. actually um reduces the amount of myalgias that they get with succinamethodium so oh, as long as you continue goodness. to use lignocaine in your proper fall you'd be fine you know you don't need to use yeah. that priming dose but also I, but i must mm -hmm. say i <laughs> I, do, I do warn patients when i use sucks that uh they they sometimes will wake up feeling that uh right. you know they've done like a big workout yeah yeah no, that's good i was just going to go off another tangent lignocaine they did a study of lignocaine profile it precipitates profile but it's a dose dependent and a time dependent thing so you know if you give 40 milligrams i think was the dose that precipitates profile but it's also like you know I, I never draw it up and leave it there i draw it up just before i'm about to give it that that way it has less time for precipitation yep. just a another another little fact <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much for watching and listening, everyone. So yeah, well, uh, yeah, this is Anesthesia Coffee Break and Adrenaline Memories. And obviously, they'll this video will go unedited onto the Adrenaline Web, Adrenaline Memories site. Um, but it'll also go up on our Co Coffee Break podcast and on the ABCs of Anesthesia YouTube channel. Thanks so much for everyone to come, come in on their morning off to listen to us just chat about this stuff. And yeah, please share with anyone who might be, uh, who might be interested. So see you next time. Bye.